So it's the one year, of course, anniversary of George Floyd's murder. Here's some of what we saw in the aftermath of his killing. I'm a thigh, man. It was the nine minutes and 29 seconds that shook the world. The murder of George Floyd. One year ago this week, it was captured on cell phone video and posted online. Millions watched as a white Minneapolis police officer, Derek Chauvin, kneeled on the neck of Floyd, an unarmed black man pleading for his life. The outrage was immediate. Protests erupted in Minneapolis and in cities across America. Many chanted Floyd's dying words. And within days, there were demonstrations around the world. Crowds demanded justice for Floyd and fundamental changes in policing. Through their pain, Floyd's family also spoke out. They executed him in front of us. Again and again. It's a lot of us. That's right. It's a lot of us. It's a lot of us. His young daughter Gianna told then presidential candidate Joe Biden her father would change the world. Later, there was a six and a half week jury trial. Derek Chauvin, who had been fired after the incident, was found guilty of murder. I was ecstatic. I was excited. Chauvin faces sentencing on June 16th. Three other officers who acted alongside Chauvin are charged with aiding and abetting murder. Since George Floyd's death, the nation has faced a racial reckoning on policing and society as a whole. A number of states passed policing reforms, but most of the systemic problems connected to Floyd's death endure. President Biden said he wanted to sign a policing reform bill named after Floyd by Tuesday, the anniversary of his killing. We have to come together. But that deadline came and went with no new law. At the White House, the day was marked by a meeting between President Biden and Floyd's family. We have the respect the spill blood that's on this legislation. Including little Gianna. While on Capitol Hill, the bipartisan group negotiating on policing reform say they're working through differences on key issues. But as they debate, black people remain three times more likely to be killed by the police than white Americans. And more and more cases of contentious police killings continue to rock the nation. Wesley, I want to come to you We've seen so many people, unfortunately, so many black people killed on video by police before George Floyd, after George Floyd. What do you think made, when you really think about it, the murder of George Floyd so different? And how has it changed the contours of the conversation? Well, I think that, as you know, uh, we've seen these cases over and over and over again. I mean, you and I have been on the ground for a decade at this point, covering these stories in various cities, sitting with various families. And George Floyd was far from the first. I, I do think his death changed the contours of this conversation. And a few of the reasons why. You know, one was that this was a death that was captured in full panoramic on video. Uh, there was no legitimate argument of, well, what happens before the tape begins? What, what about from the other angle? That There were so many people out on that street videotaping. And it was so clear uh, that the outrage of George Floyd's death was not even just about uh, the, the moment of the clash, but the, this elongated uh, knee on his neck that I think almost anyone would agree was excessive. Beyond that, though, I, I always think that these moments come in series, that George Floyd wasn't just George Floyd. Uh, we had seen the Amy Cooper, Christian Cooper incident in Central Park in New York. Ahmaud Aubrey had been shot and killed in Georgia, which was not a policing incident, but was an incident potentially of racial profiling or racial targeting. Uh, you had a populace of people who'd been trapped inside their house all year at that point, um, and, or for several months at that point at least. And then they saw this video of George Floyd, and people wanted to get in the streets, they wanted to do something, they wanted to change something. And, and, I, and I think that when you look at the year that has come afterwards, we're having conversations, and there's debates happening in cities and municipalities and states about things like changing police funding, about whether or not armed officers need to be the ones responding to all these things, things that were relatively unthinkable in the mainstream conversation the day before George Floyd was killed. Um, Tremaine, what Wesley's talking about is a really ch a changing of the conversation. You're in Tulsa, where there's this 100-year anniversary of this terrible, terrible racist massacre, racial massacre. Talk to me about how what happened in Tulsa connects to what we're talking about with George Floyd and what is really a history of violence against black people. First of all, Yamish, congratulations. I've said it privately. I want to say it publicly. It's an Thank honor you. and a pleasure to be here with you, Yamish. Uh, 
Um, but I, I think there's a, a clear connect between uh, what we saw, the kind of uh, state bloody violence we saw happen here in Tulsa in 1921, uh, to what we saw here um, with the case of George Floyd and so many others, as you guys have already mentioned. Um, but I think there is a, a certain degree of anti-blackness that America has always accepted because it's not just an anomaly, right? It's a feature of, of who we are as a country. And so even now, when questions are raised about whether this is a racist country or not, uh, we see the threads of racism spilled throughout. Um, and, and I think when we, what we saw in George Floyd in that slow motion death on a loop, um, I think exemplified the, the weight that the country has always placed on, on Black America. And when I think about um, the, the levels of violence that we've witnessed um, from 1921, uh, that kind of bloody violence, that physical violence, but then there are all other kinds of violence that Black people have been in, in, inflicted with. When you think about just 1921 Tulsa, you had the, the murder of hundreds of people where uh, the white community bombed this city from the sky, the Greenwood neighborhood from the sky, gunned down women and children, mothers, set their businesses on fire. And then after that, uh, were blocked from rebuilding. And even during that time, uh, when they tried to make insurance claims for the, the property that was damaged, uh, these insurance companies cited a riot call and put the onus on their own demise on the black community. And then you have the Jim Crow laws, and then you have redlining, and then you have urban renewal, and then you have gentrification, all violent. And I don't think you can kind of parse out, um, you know, the kind of state violence we saw, we see with the police heaped upon the black community, from the violence of hunger, from the violence of being cl clustered in the communities um, where the air is even worse, and the soil is worse, and the pipes that pump in the water into your house um, is filled with lead, and your children suffer the pangs of, of all those things. And so I think the clear connection is um, that the framing around uh, our lived experience as Black people um, creates this kind of, these kinds of moments. And I think George Floyd, for a moment at least, exemplified that. But I would caution um, whether this is justice or not, because I don't think Black folks have ever truly experienced justice. Justice is preventing us from being in those situations in the first place, not the least of which is the way we're policed in America. Mm. Sarah, I want to come to you. Tremaine's talking about really this kind of the, all of the tentacles of racism that touch black people's lives all over this country. When you think about this idea about the entire system of policing in particular, activists always say this is not just one bad apple. This is an entire system. What's your reporting tell you about that? You know, what's fascinating is what is happening down at George Floyd Square, and I'll use that as a microcosm. Um, the activists there who are many of whom are residents. Um, they have really come up with these demands. There are 24 of them that they have been asking from the city. And it's fascinating to look at those demands because it tells you a little something about how this racial reckoning, uh, how they see it and how they want to try and solve this issue. Uh, they realize it is far bigger than policing. And I think sometimes we get stuck on this rung of, you know, the policing aspect. But just as you heard Tremaine say, I mean, we're talking about things like redlining, right? And not being able to get a loan from a bank because of the color of your skin, it's still happening. Um, and so what they have looked at is, hey, can the city please give us some money and set aside some money for, for example, health care in the area? Um, can we deal with the, the food desert that may exist in the area? Can we deal uh, with the, the, the businesses and see if we can give them a boost so that they can do well? There are many black-owned businesses and black and brown-owned businesses in the area. Um, revitalizing uh, the area so that children have a place to play and enjoy themselves. And so those things they are asking for, and they've, they've come up with this moniker, no justice, no streets. And there's a lot of consternation around it because the streets, all of them, surrounding George Floyd Square, there are four different streets that come in, into uh, a cross section there, uh, an intersection. They've all been blocked off. The city put down barriers because there were thousands of people out there. Um, and those who are there and tending to the memorial to this day, more than a year after George Floyd was killed, uh, are saying, we don't want those barriers taken down until some of our demands or many of our demands are met. Mm. That is causing obvious uh, controversy because there are neighbors there that don't feel the same way. Um, but they are going about this and hoping for a holistic um, reckoning, not just a reckoning with police. A holistic reckoning. Um, that is, I think, it really in some ways ties to all the things that we're talking about. Aisha, um, I was reading a bunch of polls getting ready for the show. There is this real, there was this real spike in support for Black Lives Matter. And then we saw this, this real drop off. 
Um, when you look at the numbers, the drop off is really about, uh, in, in some ways, white Americans in particular not supporting Black Lives Matter in the same way as um, black people and people of color. What does that tell you about the limits of this conversation, what we haven't learned when it comes to this racial reckoning? I, I think the issue is America has these racial reckonings, but then uh, America goes back to this mean, to this where mm. it goes back to where it's comfortable. Mm. And so you had the, the murder of George Floyd that rocked the country, but it did not change the country, mm -hmm. right? Like there are still changes that need to be made. And a lot of politicians, and you can see the rhetoric around this has gone back to a lot of things that, you know, at the time when this happened, you had Mitt Romney, Republican going, Black Lives Matter, right? And now you have people going back into their corners and saying, look, Black Lives Matter, oh, they're socialists, oh, they're this, oh, they're a threat, oh, you know, critical race theory, this and that. It's a way of saying, look, Black Lives Matter, they were asking for all these things, this is not a real issue, we need to get back to, you know, bread and butter issues, not mm -hmm. about this. And for those people that felt a little bit uncomfortable, once things started getting talked about beyond just policing, mm -hmm. and you're talking about these larger issues, you're talking about food deserts, all these other things, when you start talking about that and making real changes, people get uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And you get back into this place of, well, you know what, I think crime's going up, I'm concerned, I, you know, I, I don't know that we need so much change so fast. And so you see politicians now uh, capitalizing on that. You know, Wesley, Aisha really went to a place, there are a couple places that she went that I want to <laughs> The one that I'm going to go to before after before I go to this other one is let's talk about crime sure. and the spike in crime in cities. Aisha mentioned it. Um, what is the correlation, if at all, between the spike in crime and George Floyd's death? You have Republicans trying to, in some ways, blame it on the racial justice movement for why we're seeing crime go up. Sure. So to start off, one. Crime is really complicated. It always is. Uh, very often the way we talk about it in our politics, even in the media, is uh, wildly oversimplified, right? Uh, that we still don't have really good ideas about mm -hmm. why crime spiked during some decades in the past, much less last year or right. last month, right? But one thing we know is that America's major cities have seen an uptick in homicide. Uh, not, and not all of them have seen an uptick in violent crime writ large, uh, but um, and many of them have seen an uptick in murder. And that uptick in a lot of places began in late 2019, well before George Floyd was killed, in some cases before the pandemic had even begun. That uptick has continued. It continued throughout 2020, um, so through George Floyd, through the protests that happened, through the fall and the winter afterwards, and in many places has continued so far this year. And so because of that, you know, there's any number of questions, right? The first is that we all know last year was an outlier year. It was, a it, was a, it was a global pandemic. And think about the types of things that happened. There was an economic downturn that came from that. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a shift in literally how we physically live our lives, where we go, how we move. People couldn't physically go into work. Um, and, and, it, and it made worse many issues that already existed. Social services were shut down. Uh, there weren't after school programs. There weren't uh, you, you know, beat the streets basketball games. Why? Because no one was allowed out of their house. Uh, Beyond that, though, uh, we have seen an ongoing uh, state of play in American policing where police officers themselves say they're discouraged, they feel like they've been villainized, they're saying that they're stepping back in some cases. There's an open question. I mean, when you look at some of the cities that have seen the biggest spikes, be it Seattle, Portland, Louisville, Minneapolis, mm -hmm. these are places that have seen intense street protest, yeah. intense clashes, and I think it would be naive to write off the idea that there's any connection between those two things. Yeah. Even if um, it's not quite fair to say, well, this was because of the protests that yeah. all this violence is happening everywhere. Yeah. Tremaine, I want to, another thing that Aisha said, and of course, Wesley, you were brilliant, but I, I was thinking about something else that Aisha <laughs> said that I need to follow about, and that is, she brought up critical race theory. Mm -hmm. She brought up people getting uncomfortable talking about the history of slavery, the consequences that people live with every day. Talk to me a bit about how you see this conversation, really this argument that is in some ways very one-sided, this argument against truth and what we all see and know to be the consequences of racism in this country. I don't know if you all have ever seen that meme of the kind of twin Spider-Mans pointing at each other and they look exactly the same. <laughs> I think in America, the more we shine that light into the dark spaces and reveal um, you know, the, the nature of this country and what we've seen at least historically, then I think a lot of white people will get very uncomfortable with that because it means you're gonna have to confront and have a true reckoning uh, with who you are and how you see yourself. 
And so if the, the veneer is cracked at all and the pieces start to fall, um, how comfortable will they be with what they see? And I think there are so many of us, whether we're black journalists or just black people who've experienced life in America, we know all too well the realities of this country and what has been. And so I think when we start to um, you know, scale up this conversation that we're having right here and show that racism is not just you know, a, a, a little nugget here or a little nugget there, that it, it casts a shadow over every institution. And that when we build the pathway to the present and you build this moment in time and this moment in time and this moment in time, uh, what you come up with is um, a, a system, the systemic nature of racism. And so I think some of it is they, they're, they're afraid of it and they don't want to get un too uncomfortable. Uh, but also the powers that be have done a great job of passing this kind of dreamlike state over America where they just don't know. Right. We think about the Tulsa, just again, because I'm here and I've been reporting on this for a number of weeks, is how many people in this, in this community, uh, white folks in particular, who have never heard of this story. They were never taught about this story in school. There was an intentional burying of this. And all the forces that be are complicit from local, state and government officials and community leaders, right, all across the board. And so I think we're, we're, we're at this, not to use the, the raw term reckoning again, but we are at this moment. I would probably call it a convulsing. A reckoning means you're actually going to have to deal with it. And you're standing there face to face with it. And we're not there yet. We're just convulsing um, under the implications of it.